right. So hello everyone. Welcome to uh, today's GroupWise 2014 webinar. My name is Joe Martin. I'm a uh, senior systems engineer here at Novell based out of Chicago. Uh, any of you, if you're on the NGW list or online support forums or the TTP, you uh, might see my name every now and then. Uh, also joining us today is Paul Lamantang. Hey guys, how's it going? All right, so many of you are probably also familiar with Paul's name. So Paul, formerly Novell Consulting and Training, and now he's a consultant as well for GroupWise. He's definitely very familiar with GroupWise in this space here. And <clears throat> today's topic is GroupWise 2014. Hopefully you're in the right spot. So as we go through today, we're going to actually uh, give you, uh, so excuse me, before we even do demo, we're going to actually talk about GroupWise 2014, what's new, talk about some roadmaps, and we'll be talking really the full collaboration space, all so those products that we've got that go with GroupWise. Then we'll go on to demo. Paul will be doing uh, some uh, slides on best practices for upgrading, and we'll kind of close off with just some additional resources as far as if you need any help upgrading and training and things like that. Um, a couple things to be aware of is everyone's phone line is muted, so if you've got uh, any questions at all, feel free to go type those into the chat or the questions window, and as we move along, we'll be answering those as best as we can. If we have a couple of minutes at the end, we may just you know pause and, and try to answer any remaining questions, but we're going to try to keep this moving along because we'll, we'll be right at about an hour. Um, other couple things is we are recording this, so if you've got to leave uh, partway or you just want to show the recording to a colleague, feel free to go ahead and uh, you know shoot us an email afterwards. You can either email me, jmartin at novell.com, and that's J-M-A-R-T-O-N. Um, or you'll be getting an email afterwards from Patrick Hines, so feel free to respond to that. Uh, so we'll get you the recording. We can also get you a copy of the slides because we'll have those available. So without uh, any further pause here, let's just go ahead and dive right into this because we definitely have a, a lot of good information here. So GroupWise 2014 has really two huge changes to it. They're probably some of the biggest changes we've had since maybe GroupWise 5x, uh, and that's in that we, number one, have decoupled it from eDirectory. So uh, by doing that, that means you can you can still run in an eDirectory environment if you like, because that's still fully supported, but we can also run in a native Active Directory environment without any eDirectory at all. We can even run in no directory, meaning we can have GroupWise just completely standalone if that's the direction that you prefer to go. To really give you a lot of choice and flexibility, and part of the reason for that is, you know, we've had a number of customers come to us say, you know, look, the only reason we are uh, using eDirectory today is because of the fact that we need it for GroupWise. Well, now you don't need to do that. You don't have to worry about syncing between them and things like that. Now you can actually just point GroupWise directly to Active Directory if that's your primary directory infrastructure, and actually retire either altogether. Uh, so that's the first big change, and the second thing that goes hand in hand is you know the administration tool has been Console One for a long time, or you know way back when NW Admin, but Console One uh, is a very e directory centric tool. So how do you how do you manage GroupWise if you don't have e directory? Answer: Our new web based administration uh, tool that's built into GroupWise 2014. Uh, so it, if you know Console One, you can dive into this. In fact, I actually showed this to a customer just last week who's on GroupWise 8. They hadn't seen 2014 at all. And uh, when I just dove into the console, because we actually had talked about exchange coexistence, I just logged in and wouldn't show them how to configure it. Right away they said, oh, wow, that doesn't look like it's, it would be that difficult to learn. And, and that's the whole premise is if you know Console 1, you know the layout of, of the tabs and things like that, it's not hard to navigate in the web-based administration tool, but it also gives us a lot more flexibility because, you know, we don't have to worry about snap-ins. We don't have to worry about the platform. I could be on an iPad at home and manage group-wise. But also there's some capability that's in there uh, that we uh, don't even have available on Console 1. And the one thing I'll note, and I should have mentioned this maybe at the beginning, our kind of housekeeping, when we get into demo and stuff today, I'm not going to be showing the admin console. If you want to see that, feel free to contact me and we'll schedule a one-on-one uh, -on -one demo of that. Today, we're just going to be showing kind of client web access, you know, end user related stuff. But from the admin perspective, those are probably the two biggest things. And then a smaller piece is that uh, the agents are now 64-bit. 
So just keep that in mind if you are running a 32-bit OS for your group rights environment today, you do need to actually migrate to a 64-bit OS to run the agents. It's strictly the back-end side, so that uh, doesn't impact the um, um, excuse me, it doesn't impact the client at all. So the client is still 32-bit, it's just the, the backend 64-bit. Now, we couldn't just do a group-wise release and do those admin changes and say, here you go. So we need to have something that the you know users need to get and be beneficial. And you'll see that in the demo, and so I'm not gonna really go into detail on these items because a lot of them are easier to just show versus try to explain them. Um, but the thing I'll call out is really at the very top because you'll see that right away, this new look and feel. It's not meant to be a drastic change. So if you know how to use 2012 or 8 or 7 or whatever version, uh, you can dive in the 2014 client, understand how to use it. But by having these changes in the look and feel, we're modernizing a bit, taking some of the cues of Microsoft as uh, done in Windows 8 or Windows 8.1. And even things like the color scheme, while that may seem subtle, the whole idea is to draw your eyes to where your data is, your inbox, versus having it you know, focused on folders and buttons and all the other things that are in there. So I wanted to call that out because keep that in mind. That's going to just be sort of common no matter how I navigate through GroupWise 2014 in the demo. And then all these other fe features, name completion, uh, control, compose views, so on and so forth. Those I'm, I'm not even going to mention right now. I'm not going to talk through them. Uh, those you'll get to see firsthand and see how we've improved some things. Okay. On the web access side, you'll see that similar look and feel. That color scheme, by the way, is there. Uh, and we've also added auto refresh capability. So if you've got users that live in web access, and, and I definitely see that in some environments, like healthcare environments, where you might have you know, a bunch of machines up that people just log in and use a browser, and that's it, because they they're shared machines that nurses and other people maybe use. Uh, if you're living in web access and you're going to actually keep it open, and work in that as your primary client, you don't have to keep clicking like the mailbox now to refresh it. The, your new emails will just automatically pop in there. Uh, and then for mobile web access, those mobile templates that we introduced in 2012, further enhanced now in 2014 by supporting the uh, upload of attachments from various platforms. You can see there Android and also iOS 6 on up. And then of course, we're just continuing to certify and officially QA more tablet uh, platforms. Now, things you need to know, again, I already mentioned 64-bit earlier, so keep that in mind. Uh, again, 64-bit agents, and also all those utilities, you know, DB copy, GW check, you know, any of those utilities that you would run on a server at least, those are all 64-bit. Now, if you're going to run GW check that's installed as part of the client, that's all 32-bit, but anything server-based, 64-bit. So that means you need to be on a 64-bit OS. If you're running on Windows, that's not too difficult because basically 2008 R2, in that, sorry, in that version of Windows and since, Microsoft only has 64-bit versions available. If you are running on Linux, Keep in mind that you need to be on SLES 11 or higher. Uh, we don't yet support SLES 12. I should call that out. SLES 12 support is actually coming in our Cornell release. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes here when we get to roadmap. Uh, OES 11 uh, is also supported along with you know the latest support packs. So again, keep in mind you need to be on a, basically a current Linux platform or current Windows platform and it must be 64-bit. Uh, as far as clients, we still actually do support XP, even though Microsoft hasn't supported it now in about a year, uh, or almost a year. Now, keep in mind, if we, uh, if you open an SR and we determine there's a problem that really looks OS-related, you might be stuck there. There may not be much that you can do because of the fact that Microsoft you know, isn't releasing any patches any longer for XP. So you'd definitely be encouraged to get to a new version of Windows, which by the way, if you're trying to do that, let's talk Zenworks and, and how that can help. But anyways, so we support Windows 7, Windows 8, 8.1, all that's uh, supported. Uh, from a browser perspective, IE8 is only supported for XP machines, since that's the latest version available for XP. Otherwise, on any other version of Windows, you need to be on at least IE9 uh, for web access. And then we also support, you can see various versions of Firefox, Chrome, and also Safari, though keep in mind that Safari is for OS X. So those are a couple of pieces that actually go along with uh, GroupWise or Mobility Service, which I'm sure many of you are running in your environments today. Um, great solution there so that all your mobile phones can access the email, contacts, calendar, and so on and so forth. We released a new version of that uh, about five weeks ago, I think it was now, 
uh, group-wise mobility service 2.1. In this latest release, number one, we support a new version of the ActiveSync protocol. And so uh, that'll, first of all, get us some new functionality that's available in there. Uh, but the bigger thing is that that also means now we can pick up Outlook support. So a very common scenario is someone will come to us and say, hey, uh, I've got a C-level, he loves Outlook, he wants to use Outlook, he doesn't want to use a group-wise client, or there's this third-party app we've got uh, that we, we need to use it, but it's only uh, supported with Outlook and not the group-wise client. So luckily, Microsoft actually added ActiveSeq support in Outlook 2013. And all the only thing you really need on the back end is something supporting ActiveSync 14, which we now have. So if you do have a need to use Outlook in your environment, you can do Outlook 2013. Keep in mind we call it a first look, and I've got some more information in a second here on what that means. So it's not officially supported yet. We want to get that support officially baked into the product a little bit later on. You'll see that roadmap, but at least it means you do have that option available to you now. So we'll talk more about Outlook in a second. The other things uh, we've got out there is really we're building the framework to support the Cornell release, some of the new functionality that will be in it. We want to go ahead and sync more types of data and whatnot with a group-wise mobility service, so we've got that into one. So one is the support for the follow-up flag, a little flag icon that you may see on your mobile device that if you tap it doesn't do anything. That actually syncs back to GroupWise today now if you're on GMS 2.1. Uh, with current GroupWise releases, even 2014, what that does is it creates a task in your task list that you would go in and, and manage. In Cornell, you'll actually see an icon that would light up in your inbox to indicate that. Sticky notes is a similar kind of thing. It's basically the, the concept of doing notes. So you may have an old notes folder in your client if you used to use the other GMS product, the GroupWise mobile server, which was the Nokia IntelliSync product many years ago in the GroupWise seven days. So we'll sync notes from devices to there. Uh, again, Cornell is going to make it easier to do. Even the contact photo sync, what we're really talking about is contacts out of the system address book, which again is a Cornell thing. So a lot of framework there to support some of the stuff coming in Cornell. Doesn't mean you can't take advantage of some of these features today. They'll just uh, look a, uh, a little bit different. Uh, and so, by the way, going to Outlook, so I wanted to wait till we got to hear, uh, discuss it in more detail. Again, no support right now, so it is what it is. Uh, we definitely want your feedback, so please, if you've got people that say they want Outlook, feel free to start leveraging it and let us know what works, what doesn't, what you'd like to see, things like that, because we definitely want feedback as we work on improving this. Uh, and then keep in mind, from a feature standpoint, whatever you could do on a mobile device, that's what you can do in Outlook. Right, so from my phone, I can't proxy to a user. I can't access shared folders. Same story in uh, Outlook. On a phone, maybe I can only access the last 60 or 90 days or whatever. You know, depending on how many days of mail you've chosen in the admin console. Same thing in Outlook then. Right, so it's not everything. It's it's via ActiveSync, but uh, at least with some of the the discussions we've had with customers, that that may actually suffice for a number of users. So. Just uh, keep that in mind as you start uh, looking into that. All right, the other thing we released about the same, actually not about, but at the same time as GMS 2.1 is the new version of Messenger. So I know many people have been waiting this for a long time. Not so much for updated desktop clients, although we do have that, and you see a screenshot there of the Mac client, but more so for the mobile apps. That's the thing that everybody's been asking us for a very long time that is now available. You've got to upgrade your backend first uh, if you want to uh, support the mobile apps, but the apps themselves are available in the Apple App Store, Google Play, and BlackBerry App World. And those three platforms supported now uh, with some plans a little bit later on to release a Windows Phone version, but that's not available yet. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, by the way, as you get ready to go to Messenger 3.0, if your current Messenger environment is running on NetWare, we have dropped NetWare support in this, so you must be on uh, SLES or Windows. All right. Again, so, all 64-bit agents. Yes. Good point. Thank you, Paul. So now let's talk roadmap because that's a, a part that uh, I know a lot of times people are asking what's going on. You know, maybe there's concerns about future of GroupWise or other various collaboration products. So you see a very busy slide here, and the reason for that is you know I actually have gone to 
well with Mike Bills, who's the product manager over GroupWise, GMS, and Messenger, and also Craig Altum, who is the product manager for Vibe, and just said, you know, where do these things stand? Let's get something out there. So you can see, first of all, the note, you know, we've got some stuff shipping right now, Messenger 3.0, GMS 2.1. For those of you that use Vibe or are interested in it, which is our kind of SharePoint, if you will, and I say kind of because it's like SharePoint, but better, meaning it doesn't carry all the, the problems that SharePoint does. Uh, the next version, the 4.0 release, is actually slated for by the end of this month, which gives us about another week to ship that. So, barring any last-minute ship stoppers, you should see that next week. Uh, but as we go forward, there is that Cornell release, which we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail here momentarily, that um, has support for the native Mac applications in OSX, meaning if you've got Mac users, you can just have them use Mac Mail, Mac Contacts, Mac Calendar to access everything. Uh, and then there's some other stuff, which again we'll talk about momentarily. And then uh, if we look at the future, so the Cornell release is slated for you know, later on this year, call it summerish. Uh, the next release of GroupWise, we want to have you know heavy focus on the end user perspective in general. So we're doing you know, some Mac stuff and some other things, but you're going to see uh, more improvements in the client and web access. We want to have some pretty heavy web access uh, updates there, especially to narrow that gap uh, between the Windows client and web access. Uh, on the Messenger's perspective, one of the big things that I've been asked about there is, hey, if I go to Messenger 3.0, does that mean I can get rid of eDirectory in Console 1? Unfortunately, no. Uh, so the uh, the architecture hasn't really changed. We just added that mobile support. But the next release of Messenger, which we're hoping you know maybe early next year, that's where we want to actually make it directory agnostic. We'll actually leverage GroupWise as the user source, more than likely. I mean, things are still subject to change, but the plan right now, at least, is GroupWise is the one talking to either eDirectory or Active Directory or standalone. So no matter how you do GroupWise, tie that in. Uh, definitely give us some feedback, uh, in particular if you maybe leverage Messenger in a standalone environment or something, uh, we'd like to hear from you there. Um, but anyway, so that'll allow us to make it platform agnostic from a directory perspective and then web-based administration when we do that. GMS side, most uh, uh, or more current uh, release that we're looking at or uh, a nearer one is our Afton release and basically that's where we want to get the Outlook support fully baked in, so uh, move it out of that first look phase, it'll be supported and whatnot. And then there's also the Outlook mobile app. So all this talk about Outlook is really talking about the desktop client, but then Microsoft just about a month and a half ago, I remember it was like a week before we shipped, all of a sudden released this new Outlook mobile app, which they got from an acquisition of another company. So we added some bits in the GMS tool that allows you as administrator to actually selectively turn on and off support for traditional mobile clients, Outlook desktop, Outlook mobile. Uh, but we just didn't have the time to fully test it, QA it, so that's what we plan on having in that release. And then, you know, a little bit more longer term, we're looking at things like shared folders and shared calendars and things like that, uh, getting to GMS. So I would say later on this year, you probably can expect to see a little more detailed roadmap as far as the functionality in some of these future releases, but wanted to give you an idea at least what we're looking at now, so there definitely should never be a concern of, you know, the direction where things are going. All right, so quickly, let's talk about that Cornell release. So I mentioned the Mac stuff already. Uh, other cool things, pictures and address book, which I, or system address book, which I kind of mentioned earlier when we talked about GMS. Uh, there's also a neat undo redo feature. I love it. Uh, just in playing around with it, if I actually deleted an email, I don't have to go to my trash and say undelete. All I can do is hit Control Z, just undo what I just did, just as if I was like in Word or some other app. Uh, so we've got undo and redo for a lot of actions. The ability to pros, pr uh, propose new times on appointments. So, you know, like I could send Paul an appointment for 9 a.m. He could get that and say, Joe knows I don't roll out of bed till 9.30, so we need to do a 10 a.m. appointment. He can actually click a button that says, propose new time, suggest 10 a.m. I get that as an appointment request. If I accept it, then he gets updated on his side as well. So it's a real neat thing to really eliminate a lot of the back and forth, because even though there's busy search capability, at the end of the day, I find, you know, even in my personal a use of GroupWise, there's times when I still have to go and tell someone, oh, yeah, technically I'm open, but that stacks up right as I'm walking into a customer meeting and, and wouldn't be available for that call. 
the proposed new time school ability to invite people in addition and delegate. So, you know, if I receive an appointment and then I want to add Paul to it, I can invite him to include him into it, which really is what a lot of people use delegate for. But if you look delegate, what that means really means I'm not going to do it. I'm delegating you to do this on my behalf. So now we'll have both options so it makes more sense. And some other stuff. Again, I don't want to spend a, a ton of time. If you want to see Cornell, uh, definitely let us know because we can demo that for you today. Uh, and there's some things about compliance with various regulations. So there's uh, 508 as far as accessibility. There's some single sign-on stuff. And there's even a, a neat use case there for archiving or, or clean up on folders. If you want to exclude certain folders from that, that's something else you can do. So with that Cornell release, by the way, again, I just wanted to show a Mac screenshot just to give you an idea. This actually was hitting a, a development server there so that you can see the Mac uh, mail, contacts, and calendar apps that are all actually hitting a group-wise back end. So we get, expect to see that coming in the Cornell release. And then quickly for those that are interested in Vibe 4.0, ton of new stuff. A lot of we're actually getting from a lot of the enhancements that you've seen in Filer over the past couple of years since Filer and Vibe share the same, uh, or I should say the same, but a very similar code base. Uh, but beyond that, just you can see here, make it very easy for sharing. So if Filer makes it easy to share files, we make it very easy to share any item type now uh, within Vibe. Uh, using a similar dialogue, actually, that we are able to, to leverage Filer for. A lot of UI enhancements. Our mobile apps have been uh, improved as well. Um, tons of stuff there. Won't go into detail, but again, if you're interested in learning more about Vibe 4.0, uh, let us know, and we can have a conversation there. So quickly, a couple of customer stories i just like to bring up uh, is, number one, United Bank. They are out east. And a real neat thing there is, you know, they've acquired other banks that are sometimes exchange shops. I mean, you see a lot of that merger acquisition activity. Well, we all know that in some cases, people are forced to get off of GroupWise, even if GroupWise was the larger platform in that case. United Bank, as they've acquired exchange shops, they just say exchange, those exchange users are getting migrated GroupWise and get them all to come together. So they've actually had a lot of success there. And in fact, Will and Bacchus, from United Bank co-presented a session with me at BrainShare that talked about number one, uh, coexistence, which I'll talk about in a second. So if you need to coexist with Exchange, and then he specifically talked about his experience with doing those migrations and looking at different tools that can do it. So if you have a need to migrate some Exchange users to GroupWise, let us know. But if you just want to coexist, as I hinted at a moment ago, here's another example of someone who did that, BJC Healthcare out of St. Louis. Uh, they were able to save see nearly $10 million in what some of the migration costs would be just by leveraging coexistence so that the hospital could actually communicate with a, a local university that works very closely with the hospital. So it's been very successful. Uh, they're one of the first people to deploy. In fact, they're a lighthouse customer, meaning that they, they got this code you know, before anyone else and uh, leveraged this. So you know, if you've got that kind of situation where you, you with uh, both exchange and group-wise, and you don't necessarily want to do the migration from one side to the other, like what maybe United Bank has done, you could definitely leverage our coexistence solution. Uh, and then lastly, I like to bring this up from an academic perspective. A lot of time, there's this view of you know there's so many free solutions. Why not just leverage those? You've know, got Office 365 and Google Apps for Education, and so Millican University. I've personally worked with these. They're in Central Illinois. Uh, a couple of years ago, they actually were still on GroupWise 8, and were determining do they leverage it when those free solutions. Uh, or do they stick with GroupWise? And what they determined was that even if they're using a quote-unquote free solution, there's still you know, migration costs, there's retraining users, they would actually still have to run some internal infrastructure to support the, uh, the cloud-based stuff. So in the end, it was actually going to cost them $35,000 just a migration cost alone, not to mention all the other expenses that'd be, that would go right along with it. Uh, by instead of migrating, they actually stayed with GroupWise. So a solution that's not quote unquote free was actually cheaper than a supposed free solution. So it's a very interesting uh, success story there. Um, so with that, I am going to just dive right into the demo. I've been seeing some questions come in, and it looks like Paul is getting those taken care of. So let's go ahead and just dive into demo to keep things moving along. And I've got just a couple virtual machines here. So let me go ahead and uh, do this. All right. So that should look 
little better. All right, so let me get my, that's by the way, the new uh, Windows client of Messenger. Not gonna really do much in this demo with Messenger, but I like to have that up so you can see it. You can see some different icons that are out there, uh, and those actually match up with the mobile app. So if you install you know, the Android app or uh, iOS app, you would see a similar kind of look and feel. But let's talk about group-wise. So let me go ahead and make, just kind of adjust the size of my windows here. So let me, First of all, call out briefly that look and feel. So again, you can see this color scheme. And I have had some people say, I don't like the gray color scheme. Well, we've got other, other color schemes available that you can give to your users. And even if you choose like the green one or the blue one or whatever, it's similar kind of gradient. So you can see basically my eyes right now are being drawn kind of naturally to my inbox itself because that's the, the white that's got the most contrast with all the uh, other areas. So the idea is I shouldn't be drawn to necessarily the cabinet or any of those other folders or buttons at the top. Just get my attention where it needs to be. So again, it may just shave off a second or two, but if it's a second or two multiple times throughout the day, you can see where we can still enhance productivity there. Uh, and this is actually being driven by we've got a human factors team. So for the longest time, you know, we did not have people specifically focusing on that. It's almost kind of like engineering is driving stuff versus people just asking how do users in the real world use stuff. So we're uh, we're doing that now. You're seeing that these enhancements in groupwise. You'll see that in Vibe 4.0. They're already there in Filer. So as we continue on, we want to definitely make stuff easy to use from an end user perspective. But anyways, uh, open up a Compose window, and you can see it's definitely got some differences there from 2012 or earlier. First of all, we want to make this a nice, you know, trimmed down view. We just basically, we don't want to, again, draw your eyes way to extra stuff so you can see all that's there right now is who I'm sending it to, what's the subject, and there's the body. Nothing else. If I want, you know, like the, to see the from field, I can. Uh, CC might be more important. I can turn that on. But the idea, if I'm just doing a regular compose, I don't have that there. And you'll actually see that, you know, if you use a mobile device, a lot of times that's the case. And on my Android phone, the only field there is two, unless I say to show the CC and BC fields. Sometimes you'll even see that with Gmail, Hotmail, etc. So again, you know, we're, we're um, you know, seeing that being adopted and again that way we can maximize your screen real estate. The other thing is we don't necessarily even have an attachments pane here. If I go in and add an attachment, I'll just add one, it'll come up so we'll show it when we need it but again why have that there if we don't need to and one thing I'll call out though you may have some users who say well I like to do drag and drop. How do I do that if I don't have a pane? And it's because I could just drag and drop anywhere in the body of the message. Though so, uh, keep in mind if you drag and drop a JPEG, that will actually embed itself. So anything that can be embedded will embed it when you drag and drop. Otherwise, we just automatically attach it. Um, the other thing is you notice I don't have an HTML toolbar until I click into the body of the window. So again, only show you stuff that's relevant when it makes sense. So I can just start typing away, you know, whatever. Let's show a, a couple of other things here. Say I want to actually send this email and address because I haven't done that yet. So all I wanted to do is just hit one character so you can actually see this new name completion control, which was one of the items that we had earlier. So this has been completely revamped. So you remember in the past the way it worked was by default we search what your frequent contacts in the system address book. And any other address books were available, but you had to go to name completion control, add them in the list. You had to put that list in the proper order because we would search the top one and then the next one and then the next. And uh, it's then you also even had to decide you want to be sorted on first name or last name as you start typing this and the default was first name. So we said why don't we just make it easier? Why don't we just search everything. Why don't we search on first name and last name and email so you don't really have to guess where any of this stuff is. And let's not just maybe do it alphabetically, but let's say that whoever you email most frequently gets bubbled up to the top. So you can see when I type B, there's a couple of people here that I email quite frequently in this test demo system and that's why they're up there. But notice how in about in the middle there Rochelle Bradley is listed and again her first name doesn't start with B but you can see the uh, the last name starts with B. Or even if I just start typing uh, an email address again as I said a second ago. So really we want to make this easier. Uh, sometimes there's some confusion because people kind of uh, remember the way things were before and say, why am I seeing it in a different order? Well, a lot of it, again, is just about bubbling up what you're actively using. So we started even in 2012 to have what we call relevant sorting. You still had to choose which address books to search and things like that, but within a single address book, we would at least show you 
the top people based upon the number of times you've emailed them, the relevance. So now we just ex you know took that concept and expanded it. All right, so let me go ahead and just uh, I'll address it to Bob, test message. Maybe I'll actually put some put some real text in here. This is a test. Now, next thing you can see down here, click to add signature. So I can just click it, boom, my signature is there. On the fly, it's real easy to choose which one I want or to get rid of it. Now, if let's say I want to actually make a change, like let's say I've got this basic one, I made my window bigger because I wanted now to show you this slide out. So that's also there as part of our compose. You'll see then whether it's a new message or reply, creating an appointment, any of that stuff that we've taken some of those common activities and included them on the right side. So one of the real common things is adding a signature, creating a signature, editing a signature, things like that. So right here, I've got this one called basic, and instead of Acme Corporation, I wanted to actually say Acme Corporation Inc. and hit save. Notice it updated it right in here, and not only did it update it here, but that literally means that is my new signature. If I go out here and take a look, there it is listing my signature. So if I were to go to Tools, Options, Environment, I would see the same thing. So we do add the ability in Cornell that you can make a one-time change in this field can't edit anything in here right now you have to make them more permanent changes but at least we've got you that ability so you don't have to tell people go out to tools and options especially if someone maybe is coming over from Outlook and Outlook puts it in a different place now you don't have to worry about where is that option in GroupWise because it's available to you immediately as you're composing or replying a message and we've got some other things changing types and stuff like that so uh, I'm going to go that Joe, that's one of my favorite ones on that change too. Because how many times have you started an email and mm. go, "Dang, I needed that to be an appointment." You had to cancel, you know, copy, paste, cancel, start over. This is great, man. You just go here and go change it to an appointment, and voila. A good point. That's a good point. In fact, and what's nice too about having it here is I've had to use that a few times. I've done that myself. Where, like Paul said, I'm composing a message. I type in all the people and realize this. I created a mail, not an appointment. I could never remember where it is up here. Is it actions? No. Is it under tools? Actually, I, I still don't know. I will never. Oh, there it is under edit. I will never ever remember where it is. So in 2012, I always struggle because when I needed to do it, I'd always have to hunt and find. But since I've gone to 2014, when I do need to do that, I can make it on the fly real easy. And since my window's a little small, let me go ahead and make this just a little bit bigger here. So it makes it super easy to make that change. And you see when I make an appointment, it brings everything over that I've typed already and I just have the option to do the extra fields. So definitely thank you, Paul, for, for calling that out. Now what I want to do too is now let me go to a reply on an uh, email. So here's one that was sent to several people and let's say I hit reply. And then after I hit reply, man, I start typing my messages, and I realize, you know, I should have actually done a reply all. So now you have to go find everybody or cancel out and hit reply all and paste it back in. Or have to, you know, it's, it's disruptive. It's not easy in 2012 or earlier. In 2014, all I got to do is right on the fly say, oh, I want it to be reply to all. Because whether you hit reply or reply all, we know who all the original recipients were. So no matter what button you selected initially to create this reply compose view, you could switch on the fly, either of those. And if I had had an email attachment, I don't know how many people are aware of that if you receive an email with an attachment, like let's take, for example, you see this has some attachments. If I wanted to actually uh, do just a reply and include an attachment, well, there's a modified one, so we'll, uh, we'll ignore that one. Uh, so in 2012, I should say, sorry, I'm kind of going back and forth. I, sometimes the, the versions tend to, to merge together. But if I right-click, I could do reply. Then I would get a choice to reply with options, and I could choose to include the attachment. But now, in 2014, we got rid of having to find that, and that was really buried, and so a lot of people didn't realize it. I've got right here to automatically just include that attachment on the fly. So if you had a case where you needed to reply to someone, you still want to include the attachment because you want to reference it or something, you make it very easy to do that. I don't have to drag and drop or do that right click or anything like that. So uh, those are a, a few of the things there with our compose views. The other thing too that I want to highlight is filing stuff away. So if I've got an email here that I want to, to file away, got this option move to and again we do relevance now my demo environment I'm not filing anything away so I don't see anything in here uh, but when I look like in my live 
Group Wise 2014 environment, you'll actually will see up to 10 folders listed here, and those are the top 10 folders that you're working with. So every time you switch to a folder and you drag stuff to it and things like that, we keep track with that counter. And so those will be listed here. But if let's say numbers one through 10 uh, aren't what you want, you could just go ahead and choose more folders 11 through 20 would actually appear right here. So I could actually very easily get to the top 20 folders I work with. If none of those are what I want, then in this dialog I can do expand and I can come down here, you know, customers, I like my hot sauces. And here I could, if I type the letter T, for instance, jump right down. So in this demo environment, you can see there's not a ton of folders. Even under this one, I've got one for every year in the year 2012. So I've got 12 folders. But like in my client, you know, I have a folder for every single customer that I ever worked with. So I've got hundreds of folders out there. So rather than trying to do drag and drop, because I actually, I even hide my folder list on the side, which by the way, you've been able to do this since GroupWise 8, that you could come over here, hide it, then it'll appear, scroll down, and get to it. So you can see the scrolling is fairly quick in this case because I don't have a lot of them. But imagine if I had 300 folders, I would be sitting there waiting forever. So this move to capability actually makes it super easy to uh, find my messages. All right, so I leverage that uh, quite frequently. So one more thing I just want to show off here. Let me get logged into GroupWise Web Access. And I'm going to sign as Bob, so let's sign as someone else. I'm signing as Adam over here in the client. So let me send a message to Bob, and I'm going to kind of move things around so we can see as this happens. Let me send a new email. Bob, important note, you're fired. All right, so I'll send that off to Bob. And you can see I didn't even touch the browser before I could even click over to it. There it was automatically popped in there, Adam's thing, important note, and that's a terrible way to let uh, Bob know that he's fired. But regardless, you can see how very uh, quickly there that came up. So again, if you've got people that live in web access, that is a very handy thing. So with that, I think, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let me get back to the presentation, and we'll just keep kind of plugging away, and I'll take a look at those questions you've been going through as well. Right. I was, there was just that last question I was just about to answer. Uh, someone's asking a question about the attachments. Uh, if you did a reply and added the attachment, would it be a brand new attachment in the, day, in the, in the message store, or would it just uh, add another header uh, pointing to the existing uh, blob file? Um, and that's well, it. And I'm, I'm, that's a good question because I'm yeah. not 100% sure. I, I mean, hopefully, and we'll have to research it. It, it, uh, I'm, it should I'm just be a pointer. It should just, I, you know, my first gut instinct is it should just be a pointer because the file hasn't changed. Obviously, if it was the modified copy, if you had edited one, it would be a new one. Yeah. Um, so, so, but it's a good question. I because because it's the reply with the attachment. I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, I I think you're right. I'll I'll look into it, and um, Sylvain, we can we'll respond to you if it's other than that. If we're incorrect, because I, I will double check. But yeah, I, I do believe that when you reply with the original attachment, that uh, it is just going to be a pointer to it. But we'll find out. And yes, you can go back to the classic group-wise look as well. It's one of the uh, options if you go into the tools options. That's another question that came in. There was one other question that I didn't answer, Joe, was the very first question about uh, prior to upgrading in 2014, uh, do you have to convert external entities to group, to uh, to real accounts? Uh, and the answer is no, because uh, they are group-wise accounts. They'll just come across as group-wise accounts. Yep. They'll just not be linked to any e-directory account. Exactly. All right, so uh, Joe asked me here to talk about the best practices for upgrades since uh, those of you who may know, uh, I co-authored the uh, Upgrade to GroupWise 2014 guide uh, along with Benita Zonre, uh, so we have that uh, guide available. And so uh, in our practice, we actually uh, do a bunch of these, so uh, we're pretty good at them. So a couple of best practices, again, uh, if you do have GMS in your environment, that has to be at version 201 prior to upgrading to 2014 because uh, the 125 version of GMS is not supported in 2014. So just one of those preparatory steps to do, make sure that the uh, all the, the ducks are in a row. Um, 
as far as what versions can you upgrade from, pretty much any version prior to GroupWise uh, you know, 2012, version 8, um, version 7, 6, 5, uh, Danita, both Danita and I have actually done them. They're not supported only for the only reason is that they're just not part of the test matrix because they're they're actually you know obsolete products from the Novell standpoint so they don't do any testing on products that are no longer supported um, but I can tell you that it works because architecturally nothing has really changed uh, in any previous version right starting from groupwise 55 up it's architecturally all the same 52 had uh, uh, a little bit of an architectural change. There was an additional agent, right, the administrative agent. So that there. Uh, again, Joe mentioned this. All servers need to be 64-bit uh, OSs, obviously 64-bit hardware, 64-bit OSs, uh, whether that be on a Linux or a Windows environment. Obviously, Windows only comes, I think, uh, in, in the 64-bit now. Slash, you still get the option, I think, uh, but I just never really look because I just go and get the 64-bit version of anything anyways. Um, again, uh, doing the copying is uh, the longest part of any any upgrade, uh, specifically if you're doing a migration, right? So if you're going to come from an older environment, if you're still GroupWise 8 on NetWare, uh, or if you're on a 32-bit Linux box, you got to move your data over from that box over to uh, your new box, right? So the you know GroupWise DB copy utility, again, you can do that live while the post office is up and running. You just use the migration stages of first pass and the second final pass, those kind of things. And you can do multiple copies. You don't. Have, it's not just a you know, do it once and you're done, right? You can have the post office live, do a first pass to get the bulk of your environment, do a second pass, uh, you know, maybe the day before, and then on the last day, that's when the cutoff is, and you would shut down the post office and do your final copy. So that would allow you to get that over. Uh, obviously, we know that today's uh, post offices tend to be in the uh, um, possibly hundreds of gigabytes, right? So obviously, uh, that's the longest part is uh, of any migration is to go and get the data set across. Um, I mean, obviously, as with all upgrades, you want to make sure that uh, you know the whole garbage in, garbage out theory, right? So you want to make sure things are healthy first. So good things to do are do your validation of your databases, your domain, your post offices, those kind of things prior to doing any upgrading. So make sure things are healthy first. Um, one good suggestion um, is that make sure that you've got your HTTP consoles up and running and make sure they're password protected because uh, if you don't have a password on the HTTP consoles, just by activating it, uh, you get access to most feature sets, but if they're not password protected, some of the feature sets you actually don't have access to. And GroupWise 2014, obviously, going to the web environment for the admin console. You also have a link from each one of the agents inside the web console to open up your admin console uh, on the HTTP monitor console as well. So a very, very good idea to have uh, that stuff um, there. Also, uh, it's not on this page here, but uh, every server that you are going to have a GroupWise component on it uh, other than web access, uh, is going to require um, the administrative service, right? So we talk about the admin service. So uh, you're going to need to have that installed. So that's that's the only new architectural change. Uh, obviously, it's all part of the web administration portion, and that's how the services talk to each other through the admin service. Uh, Joe, if you can flip over to the next screen, please. Um, the admin service has two two parts of it. There's the installation part of it, and then there's the admin, the actual admin console part. So there's really two administrative consoles. The install console is where you would go to do upgrades, where you would go to do um, in, you know cr possibly the creation of a new domain, new post office. You would go through the admin console. That admin console has some security built into it that it uses a token. Uh, environment in order to access the administrative, the install features, right? Because they kind of don't want really anybody just to use a, a web URL to hit um, and do the install. So you have to generate a token, and there's a timeline of how long you have to use that that token. Optionally, uh, and again, it's really it's, it's, it sets your option, but it's really recommended that you could convert the user mode from being token based to, uh, or the the install mode from being token-based to user mode, which would require a username and password at that point to access the installation console. Highly recommend that you do that. It's just a lot easier. Um, but you, again, that would be a every server you would have to do that. 
Um, you can also disable it. So the, the three modes are, are user mode, token mode, and is actually disabled. So that the actual install console is disabled on a particular server. So you can actually do that, the three, three modes. Um, if you're going to go that way, we talk about creating some accounts. So as you do your upgrade from 2012 prior to GroupWise 2014, one of the things it's going to ask you for is a super admin account. The default name it uses is admin. Uh, I don't think that's a great choice only because you don't want to have any confusion between your admin account from your e-directory environment and now the GroupWise admin account. Right? So I, I will typically give it a different name here. Uh, we're suggesting GW admin. I actually call mine GWC admin or GW console admin, that's kind of how I do mine. Uh, and the GW install, uh, I call it uh, GW install admin or GW admin install, which is fine, GW install. So just to have a different account for the different purposes, right? So this super admin account that you create, it will have full administrative capabilities of the entire GroupWise environment. It is not an account that exists in the GroupWise system, it just exists. Those of you who have been around GroupWise for a long time, remember the old, we were prior to GroupWise 5 and GroupWise 4 days, we had, the, we had the admin account. It was there. So in the ad.exe program, there was an admin account, and it's basically the same guy. He's been hanging around for a long time. Um, there is a way to change that password. If you actually came from that world, the admin password would still be set. There is a way to reset that. Um, <clears throat> We talked about the DVAs, and actually, not there was actually some posting on the NGW list about this uh, just uh, this morning. Uh, the, the document viewer agent, right, it's what's used to render uh, any attachments if you don't have the application native on the box. Also used by Web Access to render anything, right? Um, during the upgrade process, it will uh, ask you to install one, uh, or sorry, the, the not install one, it will ask you to install one if you're in creating a new post office or a new system. Uh, depending on if you're coming from GroupWise 8 or GroupWise 2012, it actually is a little different. Um, it actually, if you're coming from an earlier version, it actually doesn't ask you to create the DVA, so you'd actually have to do that manually. Uh, so here's the command line, and there actually is a command line utility as well as the web-based admin tool, uh, but in order to do this, you'd actually have to do this command line, the GW admin util services I for uh, install or create, and then a DVA. That would actually create that, and then you would associate that DVA object to a particular post office. Um, so basically, every server that I'm going to have a post office, I, I create the DVA if it doesn't get created on its own, uh, and I make sure that the post office is associated to it so that it uh, will uh, I'll have access to it. You also want to make sure that you actually configure your uh, web access uh, environment to have more than one DVA, right? So you really want a pool, right? So here, set up a pool of three DVAs for all your post offices and web access. Um, I have found that there's been some issues with the DVA. If I allow my post offices and web access to use it, the DVA kind of restarts itself and never shuts down properly. Um, so you end up with a lot of processes running. I, I do believe there was a patch in a later later build, but it's really not publicly available unless you go to an FTF file. So I, I will generally create two web access DVAs and allow my web access to use those two and have each post office have its own and just do a little bit of round robin uh, b between the post office agents so that they have uh, uh, some fault tolerance built into it as well. Uh, and again, to add the web access agents, uh, the DVAs to those agents is through the, uh, the webact.cfg file. Um, <clears throat> GroupWise Monitor, right, that's the tool that allows you to monitor your agents to see uh, for um, basically the management info basis, so uh, how they're performing and those kind of things. Also the ability through the GWHA, the GroupWise High Availability Service, right, which you would turn that on in your Linux GroupWise environment. It allows that the monitor tool and the GWHA service running so that if the monitor tool detects that an agent has gone down and not, not available, that the GroupWise high availability service will then, within a matter of minutes, restart that service so that it, it continually monitors and restarts any service that has failed. Uh, so basically, definitely a good idea to turn those two things on uh, in your environment. And I, I think that's all the kind of the best practices for now. It's pretty straightforward. If you've done any 
uh, sorry, yeah, there's one more page, sorry about that, Joe. If you have done any upgrades prior, so the only big got you here with the new one is this, you have to install the admin service first, and then you upgrade. So you, you'd go to a server, and install the admin server, and, and then upgrade. Obviously, if you're coming from an e-directory environment, that e-directory integration will be there. A, a couple of things have to be in place. You have to have Obviously, if you're using LDAP authentication, then you have an LDAP server already configured for the environment. The only other thing you actually need to have is you have to have the eDirectory user synchronization turned on and active uh, under the um, uh, group-wise system operations eDirectory user synchronization, and it has to be configured for a Linux environment. If you're still on group-wise 8 on NetWare, uh, you, have to, you can actually do this prior to your upgrade. You would just go into it and reconfigure and say that my agent is not NetWare, my agent is a Linux agent. It allows you then to go into the user synchronization for eDirectory and you have to tell it about the LDAP group object and give it a user account that actually has read uh, rights to the eDirectory environment to be able to do the, the synchronization. So it uses the combination of those two things for maintaining the synchronization, right? So any changes that you do uh, in uh, your e-directory environment will flow down and be pulled into group-wise. Um, that account that you actually name does have to have some rights to some of the existing uh, NGW group-wise uh, attributes. There's a there is a short list, and also the obviously the email address, right? Because that's the only thing that gets published back into the directory is the email addresses, right? Based on whatever. Um, email formats that you actually allow, right? Uh, obviously, we can actually now have Active Directory integration now, so this is where you would, you know, obviously have to create uh, um, an, a directory service for the Active Directory environment, provide credentials and all those kind of things, so to find the accounts. If you want to move from an e-directory environment to an Active Directory environment, first what you do is you would bring them in in the e-directory environment, then there would be a way to dissociate the account between GroupWise and the eDirectory environment, and then you could reassociate that GroupWise object to the Active Directory equivalent user object. So it's kind of a two-step phase, but you can do that. You could, you know, import, you know, bring them in from the eDirectory side. You can dissociate and then associate to your Active Directory account. So it's straightforward. Once the upgrade and your migration is done, uh, we've just got the cleanup to do. So basically, you want to. Um, get rid of uh, all of uh, some of the existing objects in, in, in the through console one that you don't need, but you have to remember to do this from a uh, console one that does not have the snap-ins enabled, because um, if you actually are connected to the domain, if you delete an object, it will kill it. It will, it will delete it. So uh, in the uh, new admin console, there's some obsolete software. There's some, there's a, there'll be under the system information, there'll be legacy. So things like software distribution directories, which are no longer needed for GroupWise 2014, you can get rid of. If you've upgraded from GroupWise 8, right, you may have a web access agent that you no longer need. So you can delete these objects from those uh, in, environments as well. So the obsolete gateways, obsolete software distribution directory. And then you might want to uh, consider implementing calendar publishing host as a service because um, that is actually a requirement if you want to use the Outlook client um, and do synchronization with that and you want to be able to do free busy searches from the Outlook client, uh, it is actually dependent on the calendar publishing host service being up and running because it uses the same URL uh, from the uh, calendar publishing host environment for doing that. And I think that ends it for me. Yes, thank you, Paul. Quick question, one that came in that I wasn't sure on. Um, when you go through the upgrade process to 2014 and you create that sort of super admin user for logging into the admin console, can you change that super admin's, uh, the username after the install? Yes, yes, you can. 
it's all part the GW admin utility will allow you to rename it as well or create a new one or rename it or it's called it's a GW admin util set admin I believe will be allow you to change the password and there is another one if you actually just do um, you know dot slash GW admin utility it'll give you a list of all of its commands and then if you actually do the dot slash GW admin utility that command it will then give you the syntax on how to use that command so you'll be able to find it in there but yes you can rename it cool Thank you, Paul. So I'll go through just a couple more quick things here as we wind down. Looks like we've about five minutes or so till the top of the hour. Um, so I wanted to talk about Novell Consulting real quickly. And in fact, before I start that, first of all, we've got great partners like uh, Paul himself who's helping out today, and we've got a very good partner communi uh, community that can help you. Uh, but in some cases, you may want to come directly to us as well. And we are fully able to help in a number of different capacities as it relates to group-wise. So whether you just maybe want someone to come in and maybe look at your environment, do a health check just to see are, are there any underlying issues you need to be concerned about or even to make sure you're prepared to upgrade to 2014, we can do that. We can, of course, do the upgrade itself. In some cases, maybe you just want to install the mobility services because I, I do find customers that today are still leveraging some of the third-party solutions because they just, for one reason or another, never implemented our mobility service. So we can help with that. Or lastly, if it's a case of you've just lost a great GroupWise admin that you had in the environment and you need someone to come in and provide some assistance for a period of time until you actually can you know, hire a replacement, we can do that with essentially staff you know, augmentation. And we've had a number of people that have leveraged our consulting services for various projects. And you can see some quotes here in particular about GroupWise and some of the help we've done there, especially there's a, a great quote there from a government customer in the bottom left uh, corner. So again, keep that in mind is that you know all this great stuff we're talking about with GroupWise 2014, you don't have to be on your own. You can get help from us. You can get help from partners. And there's some additional resources we'll talk about, too, where you can get some assistance. First of all, the roadmap I presented today, if at any point you want to kind of see the latest information on the roadmap, we've got that available, novell.com slash GWRoadmap. Uh, we've also got a group, the GroupWise blog, which is staffed by both Mike Bills, the product manager, and Nick Schultz, who is the product marketing manager. Uh, so you'll see updates from them periodically about things going on with GroupWise. So I encourage you to do that. And then lastly, if you do want to do maybe the upgrade on your own, but you know, would like to get some, some training on it, we've got a couple of options. One is we've actually got an online advanced technical training course called Move to GroupWise 2014, or Moving to GroupWise 2014, I believe. Uh, so you can take that as like a couple of day course, uh, or if you just want to take an admin course saying, you know what, I've been administering GroupWise for ages, but since there's this new admin console and some new pieces from an architecture standpoint, I'd like to take a class. We've got that available. So both of those classes are instructor-led. You get hands-on to virtual machines so you can do stuff. So you know there, it's the same kind of material you would expect if you were at an in-person class. You just don't have to go anywhere. Uh, and so those are available through our training services. Or if you'd rather do something just more at your own pace, we've got our on-demand training, uh, which allows you to see you know, different videos and things like that on all the different Novell, SUSE, and uh, NetIQ products. So you can purchase a training subscription that's good for one year. It allows access to all that information, which includes some GroupWise 2014 resources. And then uh, finally, what I'd like to call out is that today's uh, webinar is actually part of a whole series of webinars that we're doing. So you see we've got tech talks on a whole variety of uh, products and solutions. And in fact, we've got one a little bit later this week on Thursday, also at 1 Eastern. It's an academic focus, and we'll be talking about application virtualization. So even though it's an academic focus, anyone attending today that's interested in application virtualization, I encourage you to join that one. We've also got some uh, tech talks for our sister uh, brand of Attachmate, and you can see the full uh, list there at novell.com slash tech talks. So with that, I think uh, we'll draw to a close. Uh, I'm taking a look at the questions, and there is, you know, what one more question that came up that I didn't get a chance to answer for Madeline. 
um, and I think this was a follow-up to the question about document integration. Uh, so I'll just answer that quickly. Can you get a list of who's using DMS so they can be notified, you know, for when eventually, you know, we look at phasing it out? And keep in mind, this has been a, a long-term thing that we've, we've been talking about for a long time, so it's not something that will happen right away. And 2014 is even the first version where we've, we've done a little bit there as far as, like, not porting some of the console one base utilities into the admin console. Uh, but you can run reports internally as far as who owns different documents in your libraries and things like that to at least get an idea of how extensive the use is. And then uh, our add-ins for Microsoft Office for Vive, since I said that's the direction we're going for DMS, currently support 2007, 2010, 2013. So we support the latest at least Windows version, um, does not support you know the Mac version. So anyways, I, I see us continuing to update that. So whenever Microsoft eventually releases the next version of Office for Windows, and I think Mac is what's uh, up uh, next from what I've read, so Office for Mac this year. So I'd imagine Office for Windows is probably another year or two out. But we plan on you know updating that. So if you'd like some more information, definitely reach out to us. So we can have a more in-depth discussion as far as DMS goes. Um, with that, it looks like we're right at 1 o'clock. I don't see any unanswered questions. And there's the one we'll need to double check on as far as the attachments. So Paul, thank you again for uh, uh, joining, out, or joining today and helping out. Appreciate it. You're and welcome. Anytime. And, and uh, there actually is, uh, for the, if there's anybody in EMEA, there's a summit going on in uh, April that I will be attending. Oh, yeah. So anyone from Europe, there's the Open Horizon Summit in Budapest, Hungary, which is, what, about three weeks from now? April 13th to the 15th. There you go. All right. So with that, we'll draw to a close. So again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye-bye.